Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coop Considerations, assessing the design elements of poultry housing with our host, Kirby Lisi. Before we get started, just a few announcements that you may be familiar with. We are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Um, there's a pretty neat interactive map there, the link posted, and I'll also put in the chat if you're interested in finding out who occupied your land um, before the people who are on it now. Just a reminder, since we are doing another conference virtually, this account is set to mute participants. So you guys are all on mute for now. Um, Kirby is welcoming questions as we go. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute and speak up or put the, your question in the chat and uh, we'll try to get that answered as soon as we can. And then just make sure you go back on mute so that we can preserve the sound quality for the recording. Um, and to that note, this session is being recorded. It will be up on our YouTube channel for people who are registered for the conference to view later. And you can also revisit it whenever you need. We have a number of sponsors that make this conference possible. We'd like you to take a look at their listings on our website and in the program book. If you do decide to uh, send some money with them or be in touch with them. Just let them know you appreciate their support of NOFA. There's also an online auction going on all throughout the conference. It ends on the last day of the conference. So make sure you get some bids in, uh, help us raise some money for NOFA in the meantime and get some great stuff. There's also a virtual vendor marketplace where you can find some more of our sponsors and supporters um, and some discount codes that they're offering to virtual conference attendees. So with that, I'd like to introduce our host, Kirby. Kirby is the owner of J&K's Good Time Farm in Ashburnham, Massachusetts which provides vegetables, herbs, eggs, poultry, pork, and plants. He's been working on farms, wrangling chickens, and advocating for rural communities for 15 plus years. Kirby has a passion for connecting humans with their food system and loves talking about her journey from eating only local food in 2013, or 2003, sorry, for a college project, to starting their own small farm in 2016. She's active in a number of local and regional farm organizations and loves learning from her peers. So with that, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks. I'm going to get my screen share up for folks and make sure I can get all my little bits here so I can see everything and start this from the beginning, hopefully. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody uh, for joining on this, like what is a beautiful, um, doesn't really feel like summer actually, feels a little fallish, but beautiful uh, Saturday with the sun shining. Um, I, uh, let me see if I can get this, there we go. Uh, so just to follow up on uh, Christy's great intro. So yes, uh, Kirby Lisi, uh, she, her, hers are my pronouns. Uh, I've been interested in working on food systems for quite some time. Um, I, a, I am a small farm owner. We are on land um, from the Penacook and Wabanaki uh, that we farm on. Uh, I am a poultry enth enthusiast and uh, rural Massachusetts has been my home since birth. And um, I'm just really excited to be here today and uh, talk with you all and share um, I don't know, I like to say share uh, what I wish I had known before I started uh, with poultry housing uh, and moving things in the direction that we did. Um, so I'd love to hear from you all. Uh, you can drop it in the chat if you'd like, or you can come off. We only have a small group. So I do wanna um, really just reiterate, like feel free to 
pop questions in as we go along. Um, with a small group, we, we can sometimes make this a little more interactive in um, this weird space of virtual. Um, so if you would just pop in the chat, uh, your name, uh, do you have chicken housing or chickens currently? Um, and if you do, what's your size and scale of that? Um, is there anything specific that you'd like to learn or talk about today? Um, and is there anything I should know to help make this presentation uh, better for you? Uh, there's a lot of photos and a lot of me chatting. So um, please feel free to let me know if I'm talking too fast, too slow, um, if I am uh, not getting deep enough into an area you would like, um, you can feel free to kind of um, let me know as we go along. So I'm gonna start with uh, just kind of my uh, biggest piece I would say in all of this uh, is my like mantra. I think you can insert to farming, homesteading, chicken, chickening, growing, life. Um, and so today we're gonna talk about a lot of different things, uh, but I just wanna say that there is no right or wrong um, in this world. Uh, we all need to find what works best for us, for our needs, for what our values are, what we wanna do, um, your means, your goals, all of those different things. And I think a lot of times uh, folks like to say that there are quote unquote right and wrong when it comes to this stuff. And uh, I just wanna really put out there that um, we're going to explore a lot of different options here today. Um, some things may fit into what you're thinking about and some things may not. Um, I'd also love to hear you uh, talk about things that have worked or haven't worked for you. Um, and, you know, I think at the end of the day, we all uh, just need to be a little bit kind to one another in where we're at in our journeys with keeping chickens uh, and what our housing and those things are. Um, so as you see, we have a small flock of layers, start to re renovating a shed to be our third version coop. Awesome. We need space in the coop to accommodate a broody raising chicks and maybe separate space for meat birds. Great. We'll talk about that today a little bit because our um, main coop that we have has a separate space um, in it. So um, we'll get into that a little bit. Awesome. So uh, the first thing I think you really need to think about up front, um, whether you already have chickens or you are going to be building new chicken housing, um, is really around the size, the scale, um, and, and what type of usefulness you need out of a coop. Um, we're going to kind of use this uh, what to think about up front uh, piece as our guide to kind of roll through today what we're talking about. Uh, some other things that really I think are, are top of mind whenever I go into building some new housing for my chickens um, is really around predators, um, how I'm gonna clean this coop, what the health is going to be of my, my flock based on how I'm designing things, um, what kind of mobility I need. So we have both uh, fixed uh, structures here and also um, mobile moving coops. So we're gonna cover a little bit of both. And, and what kind of materials are you looking to use? Um, today, we're going to utilize um, our main coop. So here's some pictures of our housing here. So you can see we've got kind of a range of things. Um, some of these are in different stages of use for us. Um, and I also think it's important to remember that like uh, our freestanding coop here that we've got on the right hand side of this photo uh, obviously has a nice aesthetic to it. And that was because I didn't get a farmer's porch on my house. Um, and so I wanted one on my chicken coop. And so that was like a, a goal that I had for myself uh, in the way that this was gonna look and function. And so uh, it's all about thinking about what your scales and different sizes are. So as I said, some of our early considerations around this uh, are really what you're going to use this for um, and what your budget is gonna be. Um, how many birds are you going to have? What types of birds are you going to have? Um, the needs for uh, a flock of laying hens um, is a little bit different than the needs for a flock of meat birds, for example. Um, it's important to remember that laying hens need anywhere from two to five square feet per bird indoors. Um, and I always say the more space that you can give chickens, the happier and healthier they're going to be overall. Um, sometimes that's not always doable. So a minimum of two square feet, I think is a, 
is kind of the, the lower end. Um, and this also has to do with like uh, what your design is going to look like inside, how much space they're going to have access to the outdoors, um, how many seasons are you going to use this for. So if you've got laying hens that you're keeping year round, you also have to remember we're thinking about snow and um, snow loads. Uh, if you've got um, meat birds that you're only doing certain parts of the year, uh, you know, that design of a coop may be very different. Um, you want to think about your mobility. So is this going to be a fixed or a movable structure? How often are you going to move it if you are? Um, is this something you're thinking about moving every day? Um, or is it something that maybe you'll move uh, a couple times a year? Uh, and it's also important to think about what your land and terrain is like if you are going to move them. Um, and then at the end, it's really thinking about your budget. Are, are you looking to spend uh, a certain amount on this? Uh, do you have materials that you're looking to upcycle? Um, you know, we've done plenty of upcycling with some of our coops here and then also utilizing, um, you know, new materials for coops as well. Uh, and, you know, I think too, it's just important to remember that uh, any project can get expensive fast in this. And so um, having some kind of realistic numbers jotted down, I think is always helpful as you're going into things. So there's a lot of places that you can look for ideas. Um, I do have to say I spent uh, for this uh, last kind of uh, fixed coop that we put together, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of research on it. Uh, and the information can be a little bit overwhelming, um, but I do think there's just a lot of really great ideas out there. And today I'm gonna toss a bunch of ideas at you. Um, and I think the thing is, is to remember, um, are these things that are going to work for you or not? Because there's some really great ideas that are out there that just may not work for my setup, um, you know, based on a number of considerations that we're going to kind of roll through. Um, I think you could get into like a long YouTube haul of uh, designs and, and coops. Uh, I'll also say too, at the end of this presentation, there's a link um, that I've got uh, on the presentation. It's being uploaded as well into the uh, repertoire of uh, materials for you to be able to access. Uh, that is a little bit of a like tour. It's like an 11 minute video. Let me tell you, it is a uh, fantastic quality on my iPhone. <laughs> uh, the, the production value is amazing. Uh, that's a little bit of a joke, but uh, it does give you just a kind of an overview of two, one of our mobile coops and one of our, our bigger fixed coops so that you can kind of see things um, all together because there's going to be a lot of broken up pictures today. Um, Backyard Chickens, which is like a, a repository of so much information, has a whole section on chicken coops and you can kind of check things out by size and scale there too um, to generate uh, ideas as you're moving into this. So as I said, we're going to use our main uh, large coop to kind of walk through some of the different elements that uh, one can consider. Um, and then I'll also kind of pepper in some of the smaller scale examples from our other coops that we have or have had in the past. Um, so again, uh, this kind of first thing is figuring out what kind of size and mobility that you need. Um, a couple of just things about kind of framing this up. Um, I will tell you 100% our chicken coop is the size that it is because it is the largest it could be without us having to pull a large building permit um, to have our coop. And so uh, knowing what your permitting is around this stuff and your zoning for your, your town and your community is important. Um, and also remember um, too that, you know, you want to make sure that this also matches your ability to, to do what you're going to do. Um, uh, it also can matter whether you have things on an actual foundation or on skids. So even though our coop is fixed, it's technically on skids, meaning that if I really needed to move it at some point, I could. Um, and that also has to do with the fact of how our, our permitting works here um, so that I didn't have to, to pull a permit for um, a small barn. Um, mobility, uh, again, so if you're going to move this, how often, uh, what's your terrain like, and then I always want to say think about what the future is. So um, even though we have uh, varying like scales and degrees of housing here, um, I always try and design things thinking about like how I might use them in the future. So even if it's going to be kind of a temporary structure that I'm putting together for the birds, um, is this something that then I could use in the future to brood hens in or use in another way? Um, <clears throat> so really thinking about kind of what your future 
goals are. And your future goals just maybe, I just want to have a flock of six chickens in my backyard um, to provide eggs for me. It could be, I'm going to start this small and maybe scale up. Um, and I think one of the great things too is there's a lot of designs that you can think about um, that you can add on to. And that's something that we've done uh, here as well. <laughs> this is just a, a quick rough uh, of our main uh, coop. Uh, if folks are interested in like the nitty gritty on this, I do have all of our like um, sort of blueprints, I guess you would say. Uh, but it's just showing you that like we really roughed out what the cost of the lumber was going to be um, and the different areas. and. Again, it ended up being more expensive than, um, you know, I think we thought initially going in once we started kind of doing this. So I just, I really recommend um, thinking about how you're going to, to move through um, some of these different things. Um, and then again, uh, on the mobility front, it's also thinking about like um, how you're going to move these, uh, what's going to work for you. And I'll get into talking a little bit about our different mobile coops and how they've changed over the years um, as we talk today as well. Um, and so you can also see here um, the top photo on the left hand side um, was like when we first built our coop and uh, the bottom left hand side uh, is what that looks like today. And so you can see we've added some storage on, we've got rain barrels off the back. Um, and these were things that we knew going in that we were going to do at some point. And so we designed um, our coop to be able to, to be able to do this with. So I think the, the number one thing that um, if I can pass along anything today as far as thinking about, and if you already have chickens, uh, hopefully this is something you think about as well, um, is just the accessibility of your coop for daily tasks, cleaning and care. There's a lot of really cute coops that I see um, that you can pre-buy that are out places um, that look really nice, but from like the standpoint of being able to access into them um, can be really challenging. Um, and so you wanna think about um, if your coop is gonna be big enough for you to stand in, fantastic. Uh, do you have a door that's big enough for you to be able to get into? Um, if it's not going to be big enough for you to stand in, um, are there ways for you to easily access the areas you need to, um, to put food in, to change out water, to access a chicken that's sick? Um, all of these kinds of different uh, areas. Um, if you're doing laying hens, you also really need to think about how you're gonna access your nest boxes. Um, you'll see here, uh, this is our main coop. The top left photo is our nesting boxes from the inside of our coop. Um, the bottom left-hand photo here um, is the kind of uh, fold out doors that we have to access those eggs um, from within the coop. Uh, and you can see the top photo there is with it open. Um, and for us, because we didn't need extra square footage inside our coop, um, because it was easier from a build and design process, we left that as kind of a flat structure. However, if you're thinking about um, how to best um, make space as far as kind of square footage inside your coop, um, you may want to have an external nest box, which is this bottom right hand photo. And so basically it's just bumping that out from your basic floor plan. And that helps you have a little bit of uh, internal um, square footage saved uh, and allows you the access from the outside. Um, even with small coops, it's important to have some way to kind of access uh, eggs um, because you don't want to be crawling around and, and through different areas um, to be able to get eggs. Uh, the other thing I'll also say, and one thing that I wish we had done and I didn't really think about, um, so I'm passing this along <laughs> to all of you, uh, is the ability to clean out our nesting boxes. So if you look at this top uh, left-hand photo um, of our internal nesting boxes, you'll notice there's kind of like a one by three that runs across. Um, and that's our area for our chickens to be able to kind of get up. And that is a little bit of a lip there. Um, so it's not easy for me to be able to scrape out all of the nesting box stuff internally. Um, and then if you look at the outside of our coop, um, that uh, door when it folds down also has a, a spot there that is a lip up. And so there's no easy way for me to drag stuff out externally either. Um, and so we really have to like use our hands to get in there and then use a, an old shop back to kind of vacuum them out. 
Um, if I was going to redesign this, I would make sure that I had a nice, flat, easy, scrapable surface to kind of get everything um, able to clean out much easier onto the bottom of the coop when we're doing our big haul outs of stuff. Um, and so again, if your coop isn't walk-in sized, how are you going to access it daily to put in food and water? Um, so you can see on this bottom right hand side here, uh, this is our newest iteration of one of our mobile tractors. And I'll talk a little bit about why we have this design uh, a little bit later. Um, but uh, for the purposes of right now, uh, we have this space that opens in the middle of it for us to be able to get in uh, to the area there, um, access the water and feed um, for our chickens. Um, this top uh, middle photo is our old um, pasture pens that we used to use for our meat birds here. Uh, and you can see that there's this kind of like funky door uh, up on the top of it. And that was because right to the right of that, we had a, a hanger um, for the water to be able to go in. And so it made it really easy um, to be able to kind of open up and access that um, and to get in there. Um, in a picture before, and you'll see again in a picture later, there's a big white door on the back part of this as well for us to be able to flip up and access feed. Um, to the left here, you'll see for our, um, our goose pen that we have, which also I think is a great design um, for a small flock of chickens, um, just retrofitted a little bit to have some roosts in there. Um, on this guy, we've got this kind of large door here on the side that opens up that allows us to be able to kind of access this open area. Um, and I'll show you in a little bit this back hatch that we have as well to be able to kind of um, clean out. So here it is. Um, how often are you going to need to clean and how are you going to uh, access that easily? Um, so newsflash, uh, chickens uh, poop a lot uh, and uh, it's important to be able to get in and, and clean out um, periodically. And so um, we utilize the deep litter method here as much as we can, although that's becoming increasingly challenging with some of our like weird temperature spikes that we're getting um, throughout the winter months, uh, especially. Um, but uh, even with that, uh, underneath our roosts, we have this uh, poop tray system that's over here to the right. I've got some more uh, detailed photos about that. Um, on the photo to the left with our small coop here, this whole back piece lifts up and opens and it allows me to be able to uh, put a rake in, a shovel, whatever I need to, to really be able to like easily clean that out and access everything. Um, and then it's also thinking about uh, like our mobile tractor here in the middle, um, just has no bottom at all because we're moving this daily. Um, and so they're getting fresh clean grass um, underneath them to be able to, to move about in. And so um, just thinking about uh, how you're gonna be able able to access the high, as I like to call the high traffic areas. Um, you know, can you access where your food and water are easily if there's going to be spillage because things can get mucky in those areas um, where your chickens are roosting um, or if you're going to be doing meat birds, uh, especially, is that going to be moving every day or are you going to need to be cleaning that out very often? And if you are um, having larger doors to be able to do that. So this is our um, poop tray system that we have um, for our, our chickens in our main coop. So you'll see on the right hand side here um, is this uh, roost. Um, our roost design has changed a little bit, which we'll get into uh, in a few slides. Uh, and this large um, poop tray here uh, that pulls out uh, has this hatch on the side that allows us to just kind of easily pull that uh, every so often. So depending on the number of birds we have, uh, at least weekly it's being pulled to dump into our compost pile. And so that's the heavy soiling that happens uh, in our coop. Um, I've seen a number of different designs with this. Um, some people use uh, hammocks almost. So um, they'll use like a, a thicker fabric or a, a tarp that kind of hangs underneath that's easy for them to um, unclip and take out to be able to dump. Um, some folks use uh, um, more of like a plastic liner um, in the bottom. Us, we utilized here is actually some uh, leftover metal roofing that we had um, and just built a frame. I have this big blue line here because our design has changed on this because as you can imagine, this uh, big old hunk of uh, poop tray uh, filled up with poop um, dragging out was a little unwieldy and hard to kind of manage. And so 
unless we were putting it onto the back of the tractor or um, onto a wheelbarrow, it was hard for a single person to really carry it. Um, so by breaking it in two into two small ones, it made it a little bit easier to just be able to walk over um, and dump this out. The other thing that happens here is our roosts completely flip up um, so that we're able to have access in this area. And when we do our big main coop cleanouts where we're just hauling everything out, we're able to put a nice tarp down where you see the poop tray is outside of this uh, external door and just shovel everything out. Um, and so having a way or some sort of a, a door access that is large enough for you to be able to get a full size shovel, et cetera, out of whatever you're using to clean your coop with, um, it really makes all the difference. Are there folks that are using certain things currently? Um, so if you have coops already, um, how do you deal with your, your poop? Um, you can feel free to come off mute or pop something in the chat. Do you use a similar system? Um, are you just cleaning the full coop out because it's a smaller coop? We, we have a tray underneath our roosts too, and, and same problem, it's very heavy when it's full. And it's, yeah. it's a challenge to do by myself. Yeah, splitting it up for us has been huge because it just made it to the point where like I, by myself could go out there and do this and it's a lot easier that way. Um, and it, you know, at first I was like, well, it seems so silly to have two. And then I was like, well, maybe I'll even make three at this point because it is so easy now to just kind of scoop it out in these smaller bits um, versus this kind of like larger unwieldy um, item. <laughs> and then I also have been interested in, and we haven't tried out is using some sort of um, a fabric or um, a tarp hanging um, to be able to kind of do that as well, because I think that would be really easy to kind of scoop up and, and drag out with, with our stuff. Anybody else have anything that they're using? Okay. No. So the other thing that I really love to talk about and push a little bit around when we're thinking about uh, coop building, even if it's mobile versus freestanding, like where are you going to store all the stuff that you need for your birds? Um, because there is nothing more frustrating um, than having to um, drag bags of feed from a distance, shavings from a distance, et cetera. Um, the easier access you have, uh, I think the better um, in this. And so you'll see here in our design um, of our coop, we have this um, closet that we've built in. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see here. So you can really uh, check it out in the video at the end because um, I kind of walk through all of this so you can see it. Um, so we have this door here that's in the middle picture um, that you can access um, from inside the coop. And then the photo to the right is the, the actual like closet itself. And you'll see um, this picture is like standing in this doorway um, from the coop. To the left is a doorway that goes out to our run externally. Um, so there's access that way. And then this back wall, it's hard to tell, but that is also a door that goes into a separate back area of our coop that we use for brooding. Um, if we need to isolate, um, it's where we uh, put our meat birds before they're able to go out on pasture. Um, so we have this kind of back area as well. And so like this closet now it is really accessible from all areas. So if I need to throw some straw out into the run, um, I'm able to access that from both outside and inside. Um, if I need to you know, grab a, a scoop of feed um, for wherever, it, it's accessible from all areas. We also keep all of our kind of extra supplies, that kind of stuff um, tucked in this closet. And so um, I just really wanna like, emphasize, it's so nice to have everything right there um, and stored in a way that's easy for us to access. Um, even with our mobile coops that we have outside, you'll see here on the left, um, you may have noticed in a picture a couple ago that there's these like blocks that we built on the back part of the coop. And so in the left hand uh, plastic bin here, um, we've got uh, straw, supplies, et cetera, to be able to kind of clean out. And in the right hand side is the feed that goes into our, our goose pen every day. And so um, that all is on those blocks. And when we move the coop, it comes along with it. And so, you know, I'm able to keep, you know, a couple weeks worth of supplies um, with the coop. 
Um, and we're able to do this as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about this because we have electric netting. I, you know, I wouldn't leave feed out uh, for the masses to be able to go after. And so it's important to remember too, um, you know, how you're gonna keep predators um, and rodents uh, out of this stuff as well. And so making sure that you've got things fortified enough so that um, they're not coming on in. So the other considerations I think really to make around um, coop design and building is um, the health of your chickens. And so um, it's something it's <laughs> I think overlooked a little bit because um, we're thinking about all of these functionalities and these design pieces, uh, but really there's some key stuff that we need to remember um, to help keep our chickens healthy uh, and safe along the way. Um, so the first thing I'll say is that no matter what size your coop is, um, ventilation is a must. Um, it's important year round. Uh, so a lot of people feel like they need to insulate coops heavily. Um, I'm here to tell you, you do not. Um, the, the more airflow you have, the better. Um, in the summer months, it helps your birds uh, cool and keep the air ammonia free. Um, and then in the winter months, what ends up happening is if you're insulating, moisture stays in the coop. Um, and when there's moisture in the air and the temperatures dip, um, your birds are much more prone to uh, respiratory disease, frostbite. Um, and the big thing to remember too is that uh, a lot of the off-gassing that happens from chickens droppings uh, is ammonia and ammonia is lighter than air. Um, so having ventilation that is up high in your coop um, allows for that stuff to properly off gas. So you'll see here on the left hand side of our main coop, we have a ridge vent that runs the entire length of our coop. So we have that up there. Um, in addition on this right hand side photo with this wasp nest, which was kind of like, oh, I have this picture of these wasps, but it really shows our nice um, vents that we have on the side. So uh, we also have these side vents uh, as well that go every couple feet down the side uh, of that. In addition, um, we have windows that open in the coop during the summer to help with some extra uh, air and ventilation. You'll see here on our goose coop um, on this back piece here. So even though our, our mobile coop, um, which has mostly hardware cloth and netting um, across the front of it, so obviously it's very open, very ventilated. Um, however, when it's rainy or if there's really nasty weather, um, we'll throw a tarp over this sometimes or, um, you know, our geese like to stay in this up until it gets like to the point where we have to force them to go inside the back part of our coop. Uh, and so in the winter time, we may be, um, you know, throwing some stuff around this to help them as well. And so we want to make sure that that back part is ventilated. And so really simple. Um, we just kept this all open. Um, we did put hardware cloth around it uh, and then uh, just made these kind of little wonky looking roofs to help keep the rain um, out of this back part, which is where their um, nesting area is. So my other, like my favorite thing, I think, and um, so those will, this will be your, your like hot take of the day of mine um, is whitewashing. Um, I can't speak highly enough about whitewashing in your coop for a number of reasons. Um, whitewashing, A, is really cheap. So, uh, you know, we try and spend money or find materials, et cetera, that are, are low toxic for our animals um, to be around. Um, it is safe for animals. Um, it's cheap. But most importantly, um, it helps keep mildew from growing and, and wood from rotting um, in your coop. So no matter kind of what scale you are uh, of coop size um, and whether it's going to be a mobile coop or a freestanding coop, you can utilize um, whitewashing. And what it is, is it's uh, masonry or hydrated, hydrated lime. Um, and you mix that with water, um, you can Google it. There are a number of kind of recipes out there. Um, some folks add some salt to the mix to help with um, it sticking. We don't really use that. And I think um, once you do it once or twice, you get to understand kind of the consistency. Um, it does take a little bit of muscle to mix your, uh, your hydrated lime and water into this kind of paste. Um, it goes on 
almost very watery. So like when you're actually paint brushing it onto your coop, um, it can feel very sloppy. Um, and then it dries this beautiful crisp white. Um, it was utilized on homes in New England um, for many years to try and, um, you know, kind of help preserve wood and keep the, the, the wood from rotting um, on those homes. Um, the other great thing uh, about the lime is that it's also caustic. Um, so beyond kind of like keeping moisture down and wood protected, um, it also helps keep bugs out and stop some of uh, the possible infestations that can happen uh, around that as well. So uh, a bag of hydrated lime, like a huge bag that will last you a very, very long time, um, I think costs about $10. Um, and we've had the same bag here for, I don't know, probably 10 years now. Um, we uh, did everything in our coop when we were building it. So all the little nooks, crannies, et cetera. Um, every year um, I reapply it in kind of the, the heavy areas. Um, so the, the roost area, the nesting boxes, some of the areas of the floor. Um, and then uh, every couple of years I do a, a, a little bit more of a wider um, reapply of it in the coop. Um, and it's great. It lasts really well. Um, and it just is a, a nice way to kind of keep things clean and fresh and healthy uh, for your birds. Um, my one warning is though, is that lime is caustic. So it's important to remember, um, you don't want to get it on your skin. And if you do to, to rinse it off, um, I've had some drips that I didn't notice and um, they don't like burn your skin and eat it away, but you will have some irritation in those areas. Um, and I would also recommend wearing some eye protection too, um, just to keep yourself um, safe. Um, so I'd mentioned before that we had done um, some different designs with our uh, roosts. Um, so here on the left, you can see, and what a lovely, beautiful picture before it, the chickens had pooped all over everything um, here on the left uh, with our roosts. And we were like, oh, we really want to give them, uh, you know, natural things to be able to, um, to, to sit on so that they're more comfortable, um, which was great for a little while. Uh, until one of our uh, flock members picked up some scaly leg mites. Um, and those scaly leg mites then uh, were able to hang out and breed and invest in those uh, lovely logs that were crossed. And um, I started to think about, oh goodness, like also too, where I'm bringing in logs um, from outside, uh, there's a chance for mites from uh, wild birds coming into the coop. And so um, I think you could still possibly do um, this type of a natural um, uh, roosting stick within coops um, if you had smaller flocks of birds. Um, but because we're keeping a large number of chickens, um, uh, folks are picking up stuff from uh, their environment a lot. Um, and this was just an easy way for them to harbor um, and hang out in our coop. And so um, I think my suggestion would be if you decide to go to the route on the left is just making sure you're changing these out frequently um, so that there isn't any issues um, because we couldn't figure out why we couldn't get rid of the scaly leg mites. We kept um, you know, treating their legs with neem oil and we'd get them cleared up and then inevitably it kept coming back. And I was like, where are they picking this up from? Um, and then we changed out the roost sticks and it was fine. Uh, so we have just regular uh, untreated two by fours, as you can see over here. Um, the other thing that I've realized with the two by fours is that it actually makes it a little bit easier for the chickens in the winter um, to keep their heat regulated uh, because they're able to kind of keep their feet flat um, on those areas. And so I didn't realize that um, in the first year that we had this, most of our birds were like hanging out in the flatter areas of these logs, um, specifically because uh, that was the area that was easiest for them to kind of balance and keep their feet warm. Um, and don't mind my Yeti over here. Um, we do a Yeti on the farm every year, but this was just a good photo of those uh, roosting sticks on the side. Um, and you'll also see there are split poop trays. So the difference between kind of the full one and now the split one that's easier for me to, to haul out. Kirby, did you see Liz's question in the chat or do you want me to read it? You can, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, she's just wondering where you buy, I think, the whitewash. 
Um, so the best place to find um, the hydrated line is actually like if you go to a masonry place. So any place that does stonework, et cetera, typically has it. Um, I have seen it here and there at um, like uh, building supply stores, um, but it is important to make sure that it is the hydrated lime and not dolomatic lime, which is more of your agricultural usage uh, of lime. Um, but yeah, most uh, building supply, masonry, we got ours from like a stone and gravel place that was just up the road that randomly I stopped in and was like, hey, do you have this? And they did. So um, it's so worth it and you'll buy a bag and you'll have it forever. <laughs> and you can water glass eggs in it too. So has dual purpose. Um, so the other thing to really think about around health for your birds is um, as you're building a coop, uh, do you have an area to be able to isolate uh, birds and chickens, etc. cetera, um, if they are sick, if, they, uh, if you're looking to brood chickens? Um, you'll see here on the right hand side of this photo is the back part of our coop that I was talking about that you can kind of walk through. And so that section is literally a four by eight section that we have um, and it's attached to our main coop. So um, it's got walls between it, but at least um, it, it allows us to kind of take care of everybody in one swoop. Um, if we have birds that we are brooding, young juvenile birds, we put them back there. Um, I'll show you a little bit later in some of the photos of our outside space. Um, it allows us to be able to let the birds have their own space, but start to integrate in with the rest of the flock. Um, it's a place that if I've got a broody hen, um, I can put her in there with her chicks and keep her safe and away from everybody else. And if somebody is, um, you know, ill, but not something that I think is like going to be contagious through the air, um, I can put them back there as well. Now, you don't have to have a separate part of your coop. Um, it just means you have to think about what your plan is going to be. And so maybe your plan is like on the left here, um, just having a dog kennel that you're able to kind of isolate birds in, brood birds in, et cetera. Um, we've had a number of kind of brooders over the years. I didn't put a ton of information about that in here because I cover that in my um, kind of like soup to nuts chicken keeping talk, but um, I'm happy to talk about that at the end if folks are, are interested in some of those pieces. Um, but I do have to say like, if you're building a larger coop size, having this kind of area has just been key for us, um, you know, to be able to kind of better integrate everybody um, versus having just a big open space um, for folks. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, feeders, waters, and if you're going to have electricity, which is like a big kind of piece around what type of feeders and waters you may have. Um, I also want to say that uh, for us, we've actually found that um, the cheaper options have worked better for us in, a, in a many ways um, here. So our like uh, our usage of feeders and waterers has evolved um, over our chicken keeping. Um, you'll see this top like uh, left photo um, with our, our regular kind of feeders and waterers. Um, we still do use a pan heater with uh, the metal waterer because we do have electricity in our coop. Um, we also make sure that we keep everything kind of up off the ground. Uh, you can do that naturally with rocks like we've done here, which was great, except um, there was a lot of feed falling into the rocks. And then um, that was like, cementing the rocks together and it became kind of hard to clean. Um, so now we've moved to just more of a single cinder block because it's easier for us to clean out um, better. Um, we use our pan heater in, in the winter time, which you can see over here on the right, because we do have electricity running to our coop. However, um, outside uh, we utilize these just kind of um, tough trucks, uh, rubber, Bins. And here's a great tip if you don't have electricity in your coop and you're needing to change out your water um, in the wintertime, if you put a single ping pong ball on top of your water, um, it helps uh, kind of keep the water from freezing until we get into like those really low digits because um, your birds are going to peck at it. So it keeps the surface tension moving on your water and so you don't uh, get those skim overs as easily on them. Um, you'll see here on the right hand side, uh, one thing that birds love to do is obviously roost on anything they can. So if your feed is not hanging, um, we do have some that hang in our uh, mobile coops that we, we run out. Um, 
you will need to have something to kind of keep them from roosting on the top. Um, we used this PVC pipe and an old plastic planter. Um, we did it this way so that we could easily scoop feed in, and then it uh, also keeps the birds from flying up and on that because that's it's wobbly and they can't really uh, stay on there. Um, there's a lot of poultry watering systems out there uh, that utilize uh, nipples um, for watering and these kind of like long PVC things. You see them in YouTube videos a lot. Uh, they're really great in theory and I think could work in certain situations. Um, however, they're not great when the water starts to get cold and freezing. Um, there are some models that they sell um, that have electric um, heating elements in them um, and I would also say too, um, we have not tried it here, but um, we do utilize for our pigs and some of our other animals, um, the big blue uh, plastic um, barrels for, for holding water. Um, and we utilize the stock tank, the very smallest electric stock tank heaters, um, which keeps that uh, water nice and not frozen during the winter. And I do think that if you had some sort of a system of that scale and size with the nipples um, could work during the winter in keeping them from freezing up because um, it does work for our, our pigs in that sense. Um, so it's definitely an option. Um, it's nice because it allows you to kind of put larger bits of water out for your birds. Um, but it's also important to remember that if you've got a small flock, uh, a system like this may not be great because they're not going to get through um, the amount of water that you're putting out before there could possibly be algae or mosquitoes or um, other things hanging out in your water. Um, so I said we've like really worked on all kinds of different feeders um, over the years. And I have to say that this like really simple, silly little um, contraption that we've made up mostly for our meat birds, but now we use also for our layers um, to get snacks and some of their like more high value food um, is just a, a plastic rain gutter um, that we've plopped into on the one here on the left hand side, we've actually used a couple of um, just scrap wood that we had in a V um, with some pieces on the end to help support it. The one over here on the right, you'll see, um, we actually just screwed the gutter straight into two pieces um, of scrap wood there um, to help with the trough feeding. I will say the one kind of negative around kind of building these at home um, makeshift troughs uh, is that the birds do, as you can see in the middle, um, get up into them sometimes. Um, so with the meat birds, it's not as much as a problem because they're kind of eating and then they go away. Um, I wouldn't keep one of these in like my layer area um, for extended periods of time because inevitably they would be up there and, and pooping in it. Um, so we usually put it in um, with their snack or treat or whatever that they're getting from uh, us that they're gonna gobble up uh, within a short amount of time and then we pull it out. Um, and it helps kind of keep um, feed and um, other kinds of delicious things that rodents love off of the ground so that um, we're bringing in less kind of scavengers in that way. You'll see here too on this right hand side um, is so you'll see uh, that blue there is our main coop. Uh, that back door area is this the separate area of our coop that I was talking about. Um, and right to the left of that is the larger coop door that um, we pull items out of. So predator protection, uh, I think, is probably um, the biggest uh, thing that oftentimes after the fact we go, oh gosh, if I had just done this. Um, so I really uh, emphasize thinking through um, how you're putting your pieces together and where can you add um, extra protection. So for example, you'll see all the way over here on the right is our uh, floor to our coop which we ended up putting some boards down. But before we put the boards down, um, we ran some poultry wire along the bottom of that. So um, just an added layer of protection so that if there were mice under the coop, um, to kind of dissuade them from chewing through any of the plywood to get up in through the bottom of the coop. Additionally, around our coop completely, um, you know, we dug down about eight inches um, and put some poultry wire in there to dissuade um, you know, moles, voles, weasels, different things from 
from digging. So we, we made sure that we really thought about um, what kind of predators might be coming in from underneath our coop. Um, because it's a hungry world and uh, folks are, are looking to eat. And so we want to make sure that we're making it just difficult enough for them to find their meal somewhere else. Um, in addition to that, um, we on all of the outside parts of our coop, you'll see here on the right hand side, um, we have uh, latches that come down and we use uh, fast carabiners in those um, so that uh, greedy little raccoon hands and other things um, can't get those open and access through our pop doors, our poop tray doors, etc. Um, we have latches on all of our doors. Um, and I have to say, to this date, we have never had an issue with some sort of predator getting into our coop. Um, and I think that really has to do with the fact that we just really tried to think through um, every single way that they might be able to, to access things. Um, on the left hand side here with our mobile coop, you can see that we utilized hardware cloth um, around our coop. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, um, we also utilize uh, electric netting um, for our birds. And so that really changes our design here with a lot of our stuff because we know that our coop is kind of like got a second line of defense around it. And so um, it helps us make different decisions about how we might design this. So you'll see um, our goose coop here has an open bottom where that um, grass is. Um, if I did not have uh, electric netting going around and also a perimeter fence um, on our property that's electrified, um, I would absolutely use hardware cloth along the bottom there as well. Um, I would probably use a gauge that was large enough that made it easier for the droppings to come through and the grass to come up just so that the birds have uh, easier access as well um, there. Are there things that folks have run into with predators in their coops at all? Ways that you've maybe worked around that? Most of our predator pressure has come from the outdoor spaces. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these outdoor spaces um, and designs here as well. Um, so as I said before, we utilize uh, electric poultry netting on the farm. Um, there are a lot of different kind of models and systems for this. Um, it is an investment, I would say, depending on what type of uh, energizer you're using and the length of netting, uh, a minimum of probably 200 to $250, um, which I know is not in everybody's budget always, but I will say that um, for us, it is um, it has just made all the difference in the world. And it, it was a, an investment that we've made over and over again um, to help keep our birds uh, safe. Um, the, the electric, Poultry netting comes in a number of kind of different designs. Um, we've actually found that the Poultry Net Plus, uh, which is a Premier One product, is the best uh, for us. It's a little bit more sturdy. It comes in shorter lengths, which is a little bit kind of annoying, but um, the poles themselves are a little bit taller um, and they're staked a little bit closer together. So you don't get as much drooping as you do with some of the larger nets that can be kind of hard um, to get taut in a way that you feel good about. Um, there are energizers that are both able to uh, run off of electricity, um, battery and solar power. The solar powered ones are the most expensive. Um, the battery ones typically are dual, so you can either run them off of a car battery um, or run them uh, plugged into uh, an area. Um, we have the kind of dual ones because we do have electricity running out to our coop for us to be able to run the netting off of. However, um, even with that, uh, I think it's really important to remember that your chickens always need to have some sort of a uh, safe space uh, outside to be able to access um, should there be some sort of um, predator coming through. Um, we have a very large run um, that we've got that's enclosed for them to be in. I'm also gonna show you some examples of some other um, smaller structures that we've built for some of our ranging birds to be in. 
Um, with our run, uh, we did a couple of things, which you can see here. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll notice that uh, there's kind of like this breakage um, in our run. And so we used hardware cloth around the bottom part um, of our run. So hardware cloth is a little bit more expensive. Um, unless you, you've got a lot of cash to blow, you're not gonna be able to probably do a full run in it. Um, however, it really helps with like rodents and smaller um, critters from digging uh, into access in the coop area. And so um, we ran the hardware cloth around the bottom, dug it into the ground, um, and then used a regular welded wire for the rest of our coop. You'll see here that um, we've got uh, area on the top and so this run, uh, we actually have a small door now. You can't see it because we didn't have it in this photo. Um, but uh, in the back left-hand corner, uh, there's an area where the uh, hardware cloth is that opens up and we have our electric netting running off of that. So our chickens always have access to be able to get back inside uh, under this enclosed area. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will say, that somehow um, they know if there's a hawk in the area, if there's um, something coming about, um, they're typically always uh, on the move and boogie their way back into this enclosed uh, area where they can be safe. And so um, having some sort of a space for them uh, while they're out ranging to be uh, safe in is just critical. Um, as you can see here as well in this outdoor area, there's the door that I was talking about that goes into our closet area um, so that we're able to kind of access um, hay, feed, et cetera, in that space. Um, and you'll see to the right here, this is just a little bit of a more close up photo um, of the different areas um, with the hardware cloth and then the welded wire um, to help kind of keep both predators from the air and the ground out. Um, we, for a while, just utilized some tarps in the summertime to help have the chickens some extra shade. Um, we've now got half of this run has um, some, some metal roofing on it um, so that both in the summer and the winter, they've got some kind of like area to be in outside that's uh, a little bit more enclosed. So before we had a really great outdoor enclosed run, um, we used really simple structures and you'll see here there's two examples. One was with our, our meat birds before we built a meat bird tractor and we're using them in the backside of our coop and the other has uh, some of our laying hens um, under it. And this was just like an old, uh, I think it was a squash or cucumber trellis that we had laying around a simple kind of A-frame design. We popped a tarp on it. Um, you'll see on the left hand side here, we had some uh, bird netting that we put over the top of it uh, to protect from the hawks uh, as well. Uh, and we did that with our meat birds because they were pretty small and um, looked awfully delicious um, to our sky uh, raptors. So uh, we put that out just as kind of an extra protection for them. Um, but what this does is having something even like this just out and about in the space um, gives an area if there is some sort of aerial predator for them to get under um, and, and get out uh, of the way. It gives them a little bit of shade um, and it can be really simple to kind of just put this up and together. Um, the other thing you'll see here is we've got the electric netting running around. So, um, you know, they're protected from that as well. Um, obviously now we have some mobile coops that we run about in that space. Um, so even though we have these mobile pasture pens um, that we run about, we open those up to allow our meat birds to free range. Um, something that we just like to do here so that they've got plenty of access and exercise. Uh, but so they have that coop uh, to be able to get into as kind of their safe space. And we make sure part of that um, has some sort of covering for them to be protected. Um, it's also important, I think, to, to think about how your birds are going to get up off of the ground, um, especially when the weather is not nice. Uh, chickens like to be able to have access um, off of the cold ground, the wet ground, the muddy ground, uh, icy ground, whatever. Um, we use a lot of different natural features here, but again, um, we're very uh, kind of tuned in to making sure that we're swapping out these logs and sticks and things that we've got outside uh, frequently um, so that we're not harboring pests and other things um, within those um, pieces of wood. Uh, so we have, uh, I think every three or four months, we typically swap these out just because we've got a large flock of birds. Um, 
but you could do it uh, a little less frequently and I think be fine. Uh, it's a great way to kind of just use up um, sticks, wood, et cetera, that you've got hanging out. Um, and you'll see these stumps uh, that we've got in the ground. Um, they love to get up on those, especially in the winter uh, to kind of be up and out of the elements. And then we've got these other kind of larger roosting sticks that they can hop up onto. Uh, so I talked a little bit about how we uh, integrate with our, our coop, um, having the birds kind of close to one another. So this is kind of a, a better view of that. Uh, on the left-hand side here, um, you'll see that back part of our coop. So you'll see how it's kind of a separate section altogether. Um, so you can see, you could even start with building just a main coop and then add this on um, afterwards. Uh, and the nice thing about this is we've got lots of access doors, both inside and outside um, for our chickens. These pop doors that open up. Um, and it's hard to kind of see probably on this picture real well, but on the left hand side, we've also just run some welded wire inside um, down the coop. So our small birds, which are on the left hand side, are able to come and go freely from their back end side um, and be outside at the same time as our big girls in our established flock. Um, but we've got that kind of um, wire fence in between them so that they're able to start to kind of get to know one another uh, before we throw them all in together uh, there. Uh, so this is a great way to be able to kind of utilize and maximize the space, help folks see one another, et cetera. Um, on the opposite side of our coop, we have the same doors um, that don't go out into an enclosed run that are just open. And so um, we've got those set up on that side because this coop doesn't move. And for us, we knew that we still wanted to be able to put our chickens out into some of our areas where we grow vegetables, um, you know, to help with clearing that land out, digging up bugs, et cetera, at the end of the season. And so we have doors to be able to kind of access out the other way too. On the right hand side um, here we've got some uh, sandboxes that we've built uh, that we fill up with um, finer grain sand and diatomaceous earth for um, helping the birds kind of keep clean. Um, it also helps them uh, not dig in other spaces. They still do, but um, it at least kind of uh, concentrates it a little bit more. Uh, and then I just wanted to give some examples of some uh, other mobile coops, talk a little bit more about our own mobile coops that we have here. So for us, um, obviously, we uh, have mobile coops that we can move manually, similar to this one that you see over here on the right hand side with this uh, woman holding, uh, because they're powered by us. And so uh, there's also the ability to have coops that are more large and um, movable that you can move with a tractor or uh, a large uh, riding lawnmower. Uh, and so that's an example of that on the left hand side. Um, I would say uh, if you're going to have some sort of a larger, heavier mobile coop, you really want to think about what kind of land you're going to be pushing that across um, because any sort of kind of not flat um, area is going to be difficult. So um, as you can see, we started out with on the left hand side here, this was our um, mobile pasture pen. Um, it was kind of a riff on a, a, a Salatin style pen, which is a, a popular method for putting meat birds out um, into pasture so that you can move them. They have lots of fresh grass. Um, and in that style, you typically keep the birds inside this like flat pen that you're moving along. Um, and in that uh, design as well, there typically is not wheels um, on them. They're much flatter and you can put the food and water um, right inside uh, the pens. So for us, like this was fine when we were kind of um, moving our birds in our flatter areas. Um, although we did still need to put some wheels uh, onto the, the structure to be able to move it because uh, even in our flattest areas, we still had some rocks and other things and like dragging um, the big pen uh, was very difficult. 
Um, and then we started to use more and more of our flatland to grow food in. And so um, we started moving our chickens more into kind of the wooded areas, which they love because of the bugs and grubs, et cetera. Um, but it became increasingly difficult, as you can imagine. See this pen on the left, like trying to get that up that hill um, in a way that would work for um, our birds to move around. And so after about two years of needing like multiple hands to move things and shuffle things along, we were like this style just, it's great, but it's not ideal for what we need and how we're gonna move this about. And so um, we transitioned this past year um, to this style you can see on the right here. Um, and this was really a design because of the types of materials that we have here. Um, I know not everybody has access to um, conduit pipe bending. So um, we're already using um, these conduit pipes here on the farm for um, making uh, row cover tunnels. Uh, so I said, gosh, like, couldn't we just kind of redesign that in a way um, because they're light, the conduit pipes, they're very light, um, but they're strong. And um, even though we had built this like um, very much of a wooden structure here on the left, um, we were throwing tarps over it all the time because it, you know, it was rainy or they needed some extra shade. And so we were like, this whole idea of having um, something wide open is probably fine because we're gonna tarp it most of the time anyways. And so um, we worked with just some materials we had hanging around here on the, the farm, um, but you could totally do this completely out of conduit pipes. You can see here um, the this like front beam structure that comes down by the, um, the door, that could be a conduit pipe. Um, that just happened to be a piece of scrap um, metal that we had hanging out that we used there. Um, and we had some metal pieces that seemed to work well for a door. Um, although we haven't quite figured out exactly how we're gonna latch that in a better way. Um, so, you know, I think we're probably gonna move to just having a wooden door that's gonna be there because it's easier for us to put hardware on it. Um, we put the um, the leftover siding we had hanging out um, around the bottom. I think you could really do anything and that's just to kind of help keep some stability to the structure on the bottom. Um, we used screws uh, to put these kind of support bars across um, the middle part uh, of that horizontal plane there uh, to the, the bent hoops. Um, and then we threw some wheels on this thing on the backhand side to make it easy to kind of move. We kept the conduit pipes long on both ends um, so that two people could easily like pick this up and just haul it somewhere and or one person can uh, lift it up and move it on its wheels. Um, it's light enough that I can pick the whole thing up over my head, um, which was nice and easy for us. And because we have electric netting that is like dual layers, um, it was also much easier for us to be able to uh, just put uh, regular poultry wire around this um, and not worry too much about um, security of the birds. Uh, we let them out of this door so they're able to free range during the day and then they come back into this um, pen at night. Um, and as you can see, this is kind of a prototype. So we've got it like zip tied in places. Um, so we're gonna um, probably build a couple of these to be able to, to move our, our um, meat birds in in the future. Um, but again, it's just about, uh, we used all the same principles for design um, with our other pieces that we have in the past. It was just thinking about what's gonna work best for us, for our terrain, for the, for the area that we are moving them in. Um, and I've heard from a lot of folks that the Salatin style pens just don't work great here in most of our New England areas, unless you're in a valley, because um, we just don't have terrain that's easy to keep them um, flat and secure on um, for the birds either. So here is our uh, YouTube tour video that I've got um, for you all to be able to check out. Um, and then I just wanted to have some time for you all to ask questions, to dive deeper into any of the areas or things that I talked about today, um, share your own thoughts and ideas around your design, um, et cetera. And if not, I can dive a little bit deeper into some other spots too. Folks have questions.
Like you answered them all. <laughs> so do folks use other things for predator protection? Are there things that folks have done in their coops, um, et cetera? How do I keep my birds entertained or not? <laughs> um, we do a lot of different things in the winter time, mostly um, in the spring and summer because we free range them in such a large area. Um, they've got all kinds of things to keep them entertained. But in the winter time, we do a lot of, um, I'll freeze, um, you know, bird seed with um, peanut butter and different kinds of like treats. We'll hang cabbages sometimes for them, um, just giving them different areas. And I think that's too when, um, inside our coop um, over the years we've added in like little roost areas because the thing is is chickens are gonna um, fly up and roost on anything uh, that's flat that they can get onto and so um, we've added those areas in places that we would like them to do that versus them getting onto spaces that we don't. Um, on top of our nesting boxes uh, you know we've had to put a really um, kind of slippery uh, veneer uh, wood that we made like a triangle out of so that they would stop kind of roosting on top of those. But in addition, we left them some stuff in another space to be able to like um, plop into. So um, there's a lot of different things that we do. Um, we hang uh, like ropes that have um, roosting sticks on them too, so that they can kind of get up and swing on those in the winter and keep off of the cold ground. Other questions, et cetera? I can answer other questions about chickens too. I know we're, we're talking mostly about coop design today, but um, I'm also happy to dive into other topics. <clears throat> I'll also say for our brooder, um, which I didn't put a picture of in here, um, but if you could envision um, kind of the same design of um, our poop tray system, um, we've created this kind of box with um, the, the hardware cloth around it. Um, and we've got two trays that can slide out of the bottom of that for us to be able to clean out the brooder easier. Um, so anyone that's had baby chicks, you know that um, after about like a, a week, it becomes incredibly disgusting in there and like trying to wrangle them all to one side or catch them to get them out of the box to clean it. We were getting real tired of that. Um, so what we did is we built a large box and we also made a, a space in the middle that we could slide a piece of cardboard or um, actually we use uh, old political yard signs, <laughs> uh, which are really great because they're easy to hose off and clean. Um, so we've made it big enough so that that can slide in. So we scare all the chickens to one side of the, scare them, move them all to one side of the, the brooder. We pop in that, um, that piece uh, and then uh, we are able to slide the one side of the poop tray out, clean that all out, and then move them to the other side and clean the opposite side. Um, and it's just been a really nice uh, system for us um, when we've got larger amounts of birds. Because um, as you can imagine, if you've got 40, 50 chicks that you're dealing with, it can get pretty yucky quick. And so it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to access and clean them out. Other thoughts, questions, et cetera? Liz, I know you said you were gonna be uh, taking a shed and converting that. Have you thought about uh, how that's gonna go and uh, putting that back space in, um, extra space for your birds? Is she still on or did she leave? be asking her questions she's not even here looks like she hopped off oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right elise and royce do you have any questions any other questions no for my wife and i this is at this point purely aspirational um there have been chickens on this place before but not in the last 10 years um and the chicken coop is no longer standing from then um, this has been really useful, I think. Um, a lot of a lot of good ideas here. A lot of a lot of things to remember to think about. Um, and uh, yeah, this is at the right level. It's not quite a fire hose, and it doesn't didn't ramble. <laughs> so thank you. 
Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Um, and yeah, and I think my big thing is that, um, you know, there's been times where I've had to throw stuff together um, because I, I've got birds coming and I didn't think about like, oh gosh, we've got this area, um, you know, filled up, this place over here filled up. And so um, those are the times that my designs are probably the least uh, useful. Um, so the more time you have to be able to kind of really think about sketch out um, and, and access uh, different thoughts and ideas, I think the better um, and being able to kind of pull all of the pieces together. Um, so this is also all of my contact information. Um, I always encourage folks, please feel free to reach out to me uh, via any method. If you have other questions or thoughts or um, need anything, I'm always happy to, um, to follow up in any way, shape or form with folks.